morning, everybody. I am stoked that you're here today, and I want to encourage you to stay stoked as well. Um, my name is Greg. We are starting a brand new series, so like Sean said, it is a really good day for, for you to be here and jump in on the front end of this, this series. We're going to look through in this series the book of Acts, and we're going to look through it a little, little differently. We're going to look at uh, people who lived in a pretty dark and negative and often anti, uh, anti-world for them and how they stayed stoked in their faith, how they stayed stoked in their calling with God, how they stayed stoked in life. And we're going to learn from them as we go through the book of Acts today. Because you, you know, like I know, there are two kinds of people in the world, right? There are those who allow their environment to influence their mood or their spirit or their enthusiasm. And then there are those who let their enthusiasm influence their environment, right? There are those who, who are letting what goes on around them influence the way that they feel in their mood. And there are those who are allowing what's going on inside of them to influence the world that they live in. Those are two different kind of people. And there's this guy named Ed Stetzer. He does a lot of work with churches, and he looks at the, the, the movement of Christ around the world. He's also a pastor. And he was asked the question, you know, who is the next Billy Graham since the passing of Billy Graham? And Ed Stetzer said, Jane the Uber driver. Anybody know Jane the Uber driver? No, the people asking the question didn't know either. So he went on to explain Jane the Uber driver. He said he recently took an Uber, and the woman in the driver's seat was a woman named Jane. And when he got into the car, there was a Bible in the back seat. So he was just really intrigued at this very enthusiastic person who was determined to kind of influence the people that came into her car. And so he asked her, uh, you know, why are you doing this? And she said, well, basically my, my kids encouraged me to take a part-time job, make a little extra money, but also to encourage people. People need encouragement. And so she said, I, every day I look for opportunities to sow seeds and to encourage people in their life. And here's what she said at the end of the interview with that said, so every day I ask the Lord before I leave to show me how he wants me to share his love and light to that's what the woman who is determined to influence the people in her world rather than just letting the world that she lives in influence her. We have a couple that is part of our worship team. We call them, or they are affectionately known as the Happy Perones, Perones uh, that, because they are just infectiously, contagiously enthusiastic and I do believe that that's what it means to be a follower of God. In, in the real sense, real enthusiasm is something that is birthed out of an intimacy with God. In fact, the word enthusiasm is from a Greek, two words, one on, E-N, on, theos, on theos, which literally means in God or filled with God. So from, from now on, when you think about the word enthusiasm, don't, don't just think about it as an emotion. You know, you turned your music up real loud, and you were just enthused. This is more of a spiritual thing that is born out of an intimate relationship with God. It is being filled with God. Think of it as something that is born out of an intimate relationship with God. It is on theos, being filled with God, and it's birth out of an intimate friendship with God, with God. So we're going to look through the book of Acts and see the ontheos of the early followers of Christ, how they lived lives filled with the Spirit of God and determined to have a posture of heart that was in love and doing everything that they could out of a desire to give God glory. And so here we're going to look in the book of Acts. If you have your Bibles this morning, open up your book of Acts, or you can look up on the screen. The book of Acts, let me just give you a little context. The book of Acts is really a two-part book. It's, it's, it's a second part of two books that a guy named Luke wrote. Luke traveled with this guy named Paul who started many of the early churches. Luke was a physician. And Luke is giving an account of Jesus' life while he lived and then an account of Jesus' life after he lived, died, and was resurrected. And so in the beginning... He writes this book called Luke. In fact, um, if you've never read them together, I would really encourage you to try that sometime. Start from Luke and then read through the book of Acts. Because in Luke, Acts chapter 1, this is what Luke says. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So in the book of Luke, 
Luke writes about Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. Jesus came, lived a sinless life. He died on a cross, but he didn't just stay dead. He died as a sacrifice for our sins, and God raised him from the dead by the power of God. This is the good news that Jesus came to deliver to you and I. But it doesn't end there. It continues. So the book of Luke talks about what Jesus began to do and teach. The book of Acts talks about what Jesus continues to do and teach. And so the book of Acts is the continuation now of what Jesus is doing. And so after his suffering, Jesus presented himself to them, and he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. So can you just think with me about this. This is after Jesus is resurrected. Some of the same people that saw him crucified on a cross are now having conversation with him, eating with him, spending time with him over a period of 40 days. And in this time, Jesus is giving proofs that he's alive, but he's also teaching them about the kingdom of God. And this is what he's telling them about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this, this really important instruction. He says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Wait for the gift that my father has promised, which you heard me speak about. So he's telling them, you're going to continue doing the work that I began, but before you go out into the world to do it, you need something that my father promised that he would give to you. And this is what he talks about. He says, for John baptized with water. And the essence of that word baptize is basically to saturate, to overwhelm, or to completely immerse. So when you think about it, the way that we do this thing called baptism in water, when somebody says, I want to follow Christ, the sign of our faith is this thing called baptism in water. And we take somebody to water, and we fully immerse them in water, and when they're immersed in water, they are identifying with Jesus' death on the cross. And then when they come out of the water, they're identifying with his resurrection to brand new life. And so, but there's an immersion in the water. And so Jesus is reminding them, remember, John was baptizing people in water for repentance. But you, in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You're going to be completely immersed, saturated overwhelmed in the power of God in the Holy Spirit. And this is something that God has always wanted. From the beginning of time, when he created us, he created us to have an intimate friendship with him. But, but for a season of time, the relationship with him was through these things, these buildings. One was called a tabernacle. It was this movable tent where the presence of God would come to interact with his people in a tabernacle. And then as things progressed, uh, Solomon, the son of David, built this temple. It was called the Temple of Solomon. It was a fixed structure where the presence of God would come and people would come to meet God. But God's presence would come to meet not in people but in the temple. And now Jesus is saying, I am introducing a brand new era. The Spirit of God will no longer just come to the tabernacle or to the temple. The Spirit of God will come to an ontheos you to fill you, to be in you, my living temples, my living tabernacles. It's what he's always wanted is to be with us, to fill us, and to give us his power in that kind of intimacy. And so Jesus has now made way for you and I, and it's always been his desire for you and I to live on theos, filled with his spirit, filled with his presence. And so when we talk about the presence of God, the presence of God is not uh, some impersonal force. You know, when people talk about, like, a force, they talk about uh, the force, or they talk about an energy, somebody that just has a good energy or a good chi. You know, it's, just, it's the, the martial arts energy that is talked about. The personal spirit, the Holy Spirit, is not just an impersonal, disembodied force. It is actually a person. It is not an it, it is a person that you and I can have an intimate friendship with. That's what the Holy Spirit is. That's what God comes to fill our lives with, not just an it. Right? Because you can't have a relationship with an it. I have a phone, and in many ways, I love my phone. Right? Some of you ever told your phone you loved it? No, probably not, but you sleep with it, right? And, and you 
we talk on it, but I, I've never had a conversation with my phone. I don't, I don't talk to it because it is an it. It's not a person. It is an it. I, I don't coddle it. I don't cuddle with it. So, some of you go, well, like, what's wrong with that? That's, okay, you got a problem. That's another, another message, though. We, we don't do that because it is an it. And the Spirit of God is not just an impersonal force. It is not an it. It is actually the person of God. It is the presence of God that God gives to fill our lives, not just to fill a temple or a church, but to fill our lives so that you and I can live the way that God has always wanted us to live, which is enthusiastic for Him, for His kingdom, on Theos, filled with God. In fact, I, I think we live in a world where... Uh, God's people should be the most enthusiastic people. Oftentimes, though, I see God's people being the most negative people. And, and, and look, I, I know there's a lot of reasons to be negative, especially if you, you spend a lot of time watching news or listening to certain news portions. There's a lot of reasons, a lot of things to be negative about. But God's people should be the most enthusiastic people on the face of the earth because we are truly on Theos. We are truly enthusiastic. We are filled with God. And so enthusiasm, it's not just an emotion. It is a product of God's Spirit that lives inside of us, and it is a product of a, a posture of heart that we have. A, another guy, and let me describe the posture of heart that I think that God wants us to have. This guy named Paul wrote to some Christ followers, and he told them this, he's reminding them of Jesus, and he says this, but thank God he, he gives us the victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable, always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. And so he encourages them, look, I want you to work enthusiastically because you have the omphios, the power of God in you. And I want you to have this posture of heart that whatever I'm doing, I'm doing for the Lord. I'm not working for somebody else. I'm not working for a boss. I'm not working to please my parents or anybody else. I'm doing this in service of God. So whatever you do, see it as a means to glorifying God, worshiping Him, do it on Theos enthusiastically because you're doing it for the Lord. That, that means that, that job that you have that you go, you know, man, I just, I don't really like that job. God would say, do that with on Theos because you are filled with God. Do it as unto the Lord. Not just the guy that you're, not just the tip that you're trying to get or the person that you're trying to please your boss, but do it as a means to serving God. When you lead your grace group, do it on theos. Do it filled with God. Do it enthusiastically for the Lord. How many of you know somebody that lives kind of like that? Whatever you do, you go to school, you study. You're not just studying because you're afraid of getting bad grades. You're not just doing that to please mom and dad or because, they, you know, they give you a little bonus. If you get A's, you get so much. And, and so you're working for a bonus. That's okay. But... Paul would say this, do it enthusiastically, do it filled with God and with a heart posture knowing that whatever I do, I'm doing it not just for somebody else, I'm doing it for God. I'm doing it for God. Because we, we didn't finish this, so we'll read this back in the book of Acts. This is what they were being told. Jesus gathered them around together and he asked them, or they asked him, his, his followers, they said, Lord, is it at this time that you're going to come and you're going to restore your kingdom to Israel? And then he told them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. So he, let me just recap. God has promised them he's going to give them his spirit, his presence with them. They're wondering now, is it at this time that God is going to, and in their minds they're thinking, God is going to restore military and political power into the, the right places. The oppressor, which was Rome, is no longer going to oppress us. God is going to give us military and political freedom over the country that is oppressing us, because this was what typically happened in the Old Testament. And Jesus is delivering news, I'm going to give you power, but it's not that kind of power, it's different power. It is a power, and as he goes on here, he says, for you will receive power. You're right, you're going to receive power 
But the power is going to come from my Holy Spirit, and it's going to come when He comes upon your life. And that power will empower you to be my witness. Here in Jerusalem, it's like our city, Honolulu. Here in all Judea, that's like all the way to Waianae, to the North Shore, and to the Outer Islands, and then even to the ends of the earth. I'm going to send you to be my witnesses in my power all the way to the ends of the earth. Now you got you to remember how big this is. These were a bunch of guys who were f- uh, just days before, they all bailed on Jesus. Even this guy named Peter, Peter said, man, Jesus, I'll, I'll be with you even if I have to be killed or go to death with you. And, G- and Peter denied Jesus three times. He was afraid. And he, he fled. Now Jesus is looking into the eyes of these men and he's telling them, I'm going to give you something from my Father that will be in you, that will give you the power to do this, to be my witnesses. You're going to go and you're going to testify and you're going to tell people about the power of what Jesus Christ accomplished when he died as a sacrifice on that cross. You're going to go to your schools, you're going to go to your businesses, you're going to go to your workplace, not just here, you're going to go overseas, you're going to go to the outer world, and you're going to take this message to all the places of the world, and you're going to let them know that Jesus Christ is indeed who he said he was. He is the Messiah. He died as a sacrifice for our sins, and he's no longer dead. He is alive. Now, that was a dangerous message in their world because that was going to get them in a lot of trouble. And these cowardly group of people, God gave them his power to take this message to all the world. In fact, you and I are here this morning because somebody came this far with this message. Billions of people's lives have been impacted because they had the power. So God gave them the power to take this message, to preach this message. On the campus, in the workplace, everywhere they went, they took the message of Jesus with them. And his same commandment and his same commission is what it means to be a follower of Christ. If you want to know what it means to be a follower of Christ, this verse pretty much sums it up. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. How many of you are still in school? That's, you're going to be his witnesses in school. That's what that means. You're wondering, what, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? What am I doing here? This is what it means. You will receive and you will live enthusiastically on your campus. People will see Christ in and through your life. How many of you work a job? You're supposed to be on Theos. We're supposed to be on Theos in our workplace. When you walk into, and thank God, everybody's so negative in our workplace anyway, right? If you come in with a little bit of enthusiasm, they want to know either what you're smoking or what is going on in your life, right? There's something different about that person. We're supposed to live lives that are so radically different. They beg for an explanation. What is going on with you when everybody else is down and there's no solutions to the problems? You're going, you know what? No, I believe we can, we can work with this. Thing. Everybody's fractured. They're talking about each other. You're coming in and you're going, no, 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 let's stay together. Let's work on this together. And there's some kind of enthusiasm in the way that you do that. And it's a real enthusiasm. That is God in your life. It's not just a mode or an emotion. It is the spirit of God in your life. And the posture of your heart, this is everything that I do, I do to serve the Lord. I do for his glory. I do for his name and for his sake. And your environment begins to change because of you. Because you're living on Theos. You walk into your home and your family, and it's been a rough day. And mom is tired, and the kids have been running around, and everybody's just kind of freaking out. And mom is, is ready to do some damage to somebody. And daddy, you walk up and you say, you know what? I am not going to allow the environment that I live in dictate my enthusiasm. And you come in, you walk up to your wife, and you say, honey, you are the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, the first time she's going to go like, what's wrong with you? What did you, what'd you do? But the second time, and the third time, and the fourth time, you know what she's going to do? She's going to begin to soak up your encouragement and your enthusiasm. You're on theos because you are not going to let your environment dictate your enthusiasm. You're going to let the enthusiasm in you, the spirit of God in you, and your posture knowing that, God, everything that I do is unto you. Everything I do is not to serve me or to serve uh, just a person. It is to serve the living God. I work for you, and your enthusiasm begins to change 
your environment. If you're a teacher, you know this, right? Every morning you have a decision to make. I've got, you know, 25, 35, however many kids you got in a classroom. And I'm either going to allow the environment that I'm going into dictate the way that I feel. Or I'm going to allow God in me to create a new environment in my classroom. And you're coming in on feels. And you, you want to say, you know, kids, I'm just... Actually, you don't want to do that. Nobody ever does that, right? Yeah. That happens. I'm so tired of this and this and this and this. But you come in and you say, no, no, you know what? I, I'm, I believe in this classroom, and I believe in you. And right now, you're not going to act like that because I believe in you. And we're all going to learn together, and we're going to grow together, and this is going to be the best year. And in your mind, I know, the devil's trying to tell you, this is going to be the worst year that you've ever had. But you come in on feels. No, with God, this is going to be the best year that we've ever had. And by about midterm, kids begin to go, this is going to be the best year that we ever have. I don't know why I think that, but this is going to be the best year I ever have. Or you can come in and allow, this is going to be the worst year I ever had to shape your enthusiasm, right? But we're followers of Christ. If you're a follower of Christ, we have God in us. We live filled with God. It's a product of not just our emotions or mood, but it's a product of the Spirit of God and a posture of heart. All right, so as we go on here, you will have power to be my witnesses. God has always wanted us to live on Theos' life. It is a product of God's presence and a posture of heart. And I want to look just briefly at the on Theos of the early church, how the early church followers walked and lived in relationship with God and how they had that kind of a enthusiasm. And I'll just, I'm going to tell you right up what, what they did. You'll see this pattern over and over through the book of Acts and through the other writings of the scriptures, here's three things that they did. They trusted God daily. They walked with God daily. And they worshiped God daily. They trusted God with all the elements of their life on a daily basis. God showed himself faithful. And their confidence in God grew. And their intimacy with God grew. They walked with God daily. Daily, they had a daily relationship with God that led to intimacy. It, it wasn't like you know, I, I, you know, I guess I'm going to go to church for that hour, and you can check that off your box. Man, these were people who were hungering and thirsting after intimate relationship with God, and they worshipped God daily. Daily, they they took time to pause and to thank God for their lives and just to open up their heart to Him. And this is how it's described in the Book of Acts. Just li listen to this picture that. That, um, uh, that Luke paints as far as how they gathered together. They devoted themselves. There was this devotion that came out. They devoted them, themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers, they were together and they had everything in common. They sold their property and their possessions to give to anyone who had need. Now, now think about this. As they're doing this, they're living amongst a bunch of people, many of them who are really struggling to get by. But there is this community where people are trusting God. They're walking with God. They're worshiping God. And there is this intimacy and relationship with God that is happening. And the people that are not part of their community see this thing happening. This is a new thing. This is, this is called the church. They don't know it yet. And they see this enthusiastic lifestyle happening. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They were praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. So what do you think happened in a world that was pretty impoverished and difficult to make it as they see this community just thriving in their intimate relationship with God? Man, people are going, I want to be a part of that. They're taking care of each other. They're loving God. Their practical needs are being met. And they're worshiping and they're praising and they're thanking God. And there is this intimacy that leads to this on theos. And the people that are seeing this community are thinking, I want to be a part of this. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
And daily people were going, man, I, I want you to come. I want you to come and see this. I had lunch with them the other day, and, and, and I want you to come to my grace group and see this on the field. See what happens when these followers of Christ get together, and we just begin to pray for our daily needs, and, we, and, and they're walking with God. They seem to have a relationship with him, and, and they even worship. You know how we go to the UH games? We get all excited about those things. Man, when we come to church, there are a bunch of people in there. They're doing the same thing, but they're doing it in response to God. And, they, and your friend comes into the environment, and they're like, man, there's something different here. How can I be a part of that? And that was happening in the early church. People see the on fields of the early followers of Christ. It's why some of you, and, and I, I love this service. I love all of our, this is our third service of the day. But in this service, I love this because you guys engage in worship. Many of you engage in worship. Some of you, you just, you're on theos. You come in here on theos. Why is that? Because you're trusting God in your daily life. You have a need and you're saying, Jesus, I'm trusting you to help me and meet me at this place of need. And God answers it and your confidence in God grows. You're walking with God daily. In fact, some of you, you read your Bible this morning. You spent time in the Word of God and God spoke to you through it. And you have confidence that God hears you and he responds to you and he's speaking to you through it. And you're trusting God and you're walking with God. And, and, and there are some people that, not, not in this service, but in our other services, they come really late just to kind of like catch the last five minutes of worship. And, and you can already tell, you know, some people are kind of like, man, I just can't wait till this thing is over. But some of you, you are here and you know when you come and you worship, you don't care what anybody thinks about, about you. Because your posture of heart is, I'm not doing this for anybody. I'm doing this for the Lord. And you're in the presence of God, and he's speaking to you. And man, as much as I love the word of God and believe that it's important for you to hear it and God speaks to you through it, I just want to tell you, if you're missing the worship part, you are missing your opportunity to come and to thank God and to have him speak to you and to have him draw near to your life. And meet you face to face and be in the presence of God. And it changes who you are. And I'm, I'm going to encourage, especially the guys. I know it's kind of awkward, right? I think, I think singing and, you know, moving, that's kind of, that's more, it seems to me more to be a natural female aspect, you know. Females can do it a little bit more normally. Our guys, we come in here and, you know, depending on your dance level, you're kind of like, you know, what do, I, what do I do? And so it's kind of awkward. You're like, you know, okay, I think I feel like I should do something. I just want to encourage you to take a step wherever you are to begin to ask God to fill you with his on theos and to let that break you out and let your posture of heart be, God, I, I don't really care who's on my left or on my right. I'm not here for anybody else. I'm here for you. And by faith, begin to worship God wherever you're at. So if that means taking your hands and unlocking them from your pockets and offering Jesus a banana bread loaf. Do that. Start there. If it's to do a little octopus thing, whatever, just take a step from where you are to enthusiastically begin to worship God, whatever that looks like for you. Challenge yourself to go beyond where you're at because Jesus wants to meet you in that place of your faith in worship as we live on Theos. Some of you come in like that. Why? Because you're trusting God daily. Because you're walking with Jesus daily. Because you're worshiping him daily. Now the thing about on Theos is that our enthusiasm can begin to wear thin. Especially, I, I notice, especially the longer somebody has been in a relationship with God. And when, when, I, when I first came into a relationship with God 30 years ago, I remember the people around me, you know, the older people, they were more mature, were a little, like, overwhelmed by my enthusiasm. So they were like, you know, young boy, kind of calm down a little bit, gain some wisdom, which is good. I think, I honestly, I think that is good, getting wisdom. But that doesn't need to diminish our enthusiasm for the call of God on our life. And the quickest way to lose your enthusiasm is to take your eyes off of your calling and begin to put them on your comfort. And that happens as we grow older in our relationship with God oftentimes. And I want to look at the example 
of a guy uh, that is, is, is really, uh, really well known, even if you've never really read the Bible. His name is David. David wrote many of these things called psalms. They were songs of worship to God. David was an enthusiastic lover of God. And David was also the guy who is known as the one who killed the giant, Goliath, right? Remember that story as a, as a young, young person, a teenager. I mean, there is no age limit. Like, you know, to get a license, you have to be at least 16, right? If you want to serve God and be enthusiastic about your calling, you don't have to hit a certain age. All you have to be is filled with God and have a heart posture that says, God, I want to do this for your glory. And David was that guy. So in their day when they had battles against two, two different people, what they would do is they would send out a champion from one of their tribes to fight a champion from the other tribe. And whoever won the battle, basically the army would then take uh, total submission over the other army. So in this particular instance, Philistine army met the Israelite army and the giant Goliath came out as the champion from the Philistines, and then there was nobody from the Israelites. And the reason why there was nobody is because the champion from the Philistines, he was about nine foot six inches tall. Now, I'm not exactly sure how tall that is, but that's a little bit taller than me. But that's probably, probably like to the, to the bottom of that red curtain right there. And, and nobody responded to this challenge, even though this guy was totally smack-talking and degrading their army and degrading their God, nobody rose up. They were all afraid. But this teenage boy who loved God and walked in an intimate relationship with God came on Theos on the scene. And he heard Goliath mocking the army and mocking God. And he said, isn't somebody going to do something about the glory of God well, this giant, he's just a man, says all these things about him. And everybody was just like, young boy, just settle down already. Well, David didn't settle down. In fact, he was so strong that eventually they said, okay, you think you can do something about it? Go for it. And I, I don't know what a teenage boy of their day looked like. I'm just going to think he's probably about my height, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit taller. Teenage boy, maybe young 20-year-old. He was a shepherd. He wasn't a warrior. Went to meet a battle, in, uh, meet a giant in battle, and he took with him five stones. He was a shepherd, so he had a sling and stones, but he, he would use that to, you know, scatter the, um, the wolves and other predators that would try and attack the sheep. And so he took what he was familiar with out to meet the giant from battle and listen to the description of the enthusiasm that, that David displays as he goes to meet the giant. In 1 Samuel, it says this, as the Philistine moved closer to attack, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Now, can you imagine this? I mean, can you imagine everybody watching this thing? Nine foot six, giant, 125 pounds of armor, big spear, a shield so big that somebody else has to carry it, and a shepherd boy, no armor, a sling, and some rocks. And the giant steps forward, and David runs towards him, not away from him. He runs enthusiastically, confident that if he steps up, God will step up. He takes a rock. He puts it in the sling. The guy has a full helmet on, and somehow this rock finds the precise place where there is no metal covering his head. And I love the description of this. Reaching into his bag, he took out a stone. He slung it, and he struck the Philistine on the forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead. Now, I don't know what that looks like, but in my, you know, in my cinema mind, I'm thinking this is just a moment where everybody that day who thought the giant was going to destroy this boy has a moment where they just watch the stone sink into his head and this giant of a man fall dead. Can you imagine? Dumbfounded. Like, what the? And then the Philistine armies take off. And the Israelite armies chase after them. All because a young boy in an intimate relationship with God steps up filled with the Spirit of God, saying, I'm going to do this to the glory of God. And God uses him to destroy the giant and to free the Israelites. And then years go by, 
And that boy grows up. He becomes the king of a nation. He fights many battles, does amazing things for God. But then there comes a period where God gives them peace. And God gives them rest. And there are times in our lives, and and, and these are the times, there's moments of peace and rest when we begin to look away from the call of God and we begin to set our eyes on our comfort. And during this time of peace, because you know how it is, right? When, when, When you're desperately in need for God, even though those are some of the most difficult moments, aren't those in hindsight some of the best Because you're praying, you're seeking God, and you're experiencing his active presence in your life. And there's intimacy that's coming. And you're sharing your faith, and God has just done something. Man, you can't wait to go to the workplace and tell people, man, I I know what you're going through, but you're not going to believe this. God did this in my life. And you're doing what the early followers are doing. You're going in the power of God, being a witness to who Jesus is and what he can do in those moments of difficulty. But then things kind of tone themselves down. And we kind of start to cruise. It's not that we leave Jesus. I'm still, Jesus and I, we're still cool. We're just not as desperate anymore. We're not as desperate for the call of God on our life. And David begins to experience a season of rest and a season of peace. And his eyes begin to change from looking at the call of God to his own comfort. And there is this period in David's life where he as a king is supposed to lead his troops out to battle. He's supposed to go like the young David and run to the battle. Right? We live in a world where there's, a, there's a, you know, if you're not familiar with this, this will be really helpful. There's a spiritual battle going on. And God's people are supposed to be the ones that run to it. And David was that guy that ran to it and led everybody to run to it. And now in this moment of his life, he says, you know what? I'm going to let somebody else do this now. And so this is what happens in a time when David now, his kingdom is established. He's experiencing a little bit of rest and peace. He says, in the spring and at the time when kings go off to war, David sent somebody else. He sent Joab out with the king's whole army. And they destroyed the Ammonites and they besieged Rabbah. But David, he remained in Jerusalem. And what happened after he remained in Jerusalem is one of the most um, amazing moments of somebody who is on theos with God, beginning to look away from the call of God to their own comfort and what that produces. David stayed at home in Jerusalem, and for some reason he went up on his rooftop and he saw a woman, beautiful woman, taking a shower on her rooftop. I'm not sure what she was doing doing that, but she was there. And David, because he was where he shouldn't have been, saw what he shouldn't have seen and did what he shouldn't have done. He called that woman over. He had a relationship and affair with her while everybody else is off in battle. And David is supposed to be pursuing his call. He gives himself to pursue comfort. And in this comfortable moment, he gets this woman pregnant. Long story short, he ends up killing or having the husband murdered to put away this, this, this terrible secret that he was living with. A guy who had been on theos, filled with God, enthusiastic, ran to meet the battle, sent somebody else to do it. This is kind of two summary statements. With enthusiasm, David, he ran into the battle to serve God. But then with apathy, David walked on his roof to serve his comfort. So let me just ask you, where do you feel like you're at today? Today. Where do you feel like you're at today? Are you you running after your call with enthusiasm, filled with God? You you wake up in the morning and and you just, you know there's divine purpose in your day. You walk into your workplace and you just can't wait to share what God has done in your life. Or the stories that you're carrying, stories that happened three, five years ago. There are things that God did, but he hasn't done recently. And God seems a little bit more distant. Are you, are you, are you like, man, I, I can't wait to witness somebody. I can't wait to share what God has done in my life. Or is it more, you know, I'm more wanting what I want for me right now. I would serve. I see other people serving, but I'm just kind of busy right now. I would give, but, you know, maybe somebody else will give. 
I would pray, and I remember I used to pray, and I, I, I know there are people in my life that need prayer, and it would be a really helpful thing, but I got teenagers, and, and we got things to do, and we're busy. I, I used to love to pray, but not so much anymore because I'm busy, and I got things going on. I would worship, and I know God deserves my worship. Man, he died on the cross for me. He rose from the dead. He gives me his power. He deserves it, but it's just it's hard to commit to being in that environment where I can worship. Are you on Theos? Or are you at a place where you need God to bring you back on Theos? Peter goes on to, to tell the early followers of Christ, the early church, if you find your place, yourself in a place where you need to be refreshed in the presence of God so you can live on Theos, here's what you do. You repent and you turn to God. That repent means what, whatever it is you've gotten your eyes on, Turn away from them back to the call of God and back to God so that your sins can be cleansed from your, your life wiped away so that times of refreshing can come from the presence of the Lord. God wants to refresh you and I in his presence because we can live one or two ways. We can allow the environment that we live in dictate our mood and our spirit or we can allow our enthusiasm to influence the environment that we live in. We can live in the power of God and take the gospel to all the world, to our workplace, to your family. Or we can just be good with where we're at. God wants to break us out of that place of comfort into that place of ontheos. Worship team, come and join me this morning. Because ontheos and enthusiasm, it's not just a product of our emotions or of our mood. It is a product of God's spirit in our lives and a posture of heart that says, everything that I do, I am doing to serve the Lord. Everything that I do, I am working enthusiastically for the Lord. It is born out of an intimate relationship with God. And I am I'm enthusiastic this morning because I believe that many of you today are going to get enthusiastic for God today. You're going to return to enthusiasm. And because of that, the world around you and the people around you are going to benefit from it. Your family is going to benefit from it. Your workplace is going to benefit from it. This church will benefit from it. And your witness for Jesus Christ will grow because you're going to live on Theos with God.